All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Drew Dinsick, recording on Thursday afternoon. Today we're going to talk uh, a little NBA recap off of uh, Wednesday night. We'll talk about the All Star Weekend and what can be bet on there. Also hit WTA Doha uh, with a couple of big matches, and then we'll close out with some puck. Uh, which is why the great Nathan McKinnon, uh, his jersey sits behind me today. Uh, we'll talk about the Stanley Cup odds uh, and a bet that I like there. Uh, but let's start off with the NBA. Uh, strange night, a weird, wonky, uh, two weird, wonky nationally televised games where it looked like the Cavs were going to have another just bizarre defeat as a nine and a half point favorite. And then they pulled that out. The Warriors uh, kind of play with their food in the fourth quarter, uh, and Norm Powell, who we'll get to, goes off. Clippers <laughs> win there. Uh, and then Jokic just has one of these random bad games that he seems to have every couple of weeks and was frequently having in December where he really just didn't leave his feet. I know he doesn't really leave his feet most of the time, but it just seemed like he had nothing in the tank, has a really bad game, uh, and they blow a game that was in hand to the Kings and the Nuggets are now two and a half games back of the ones uh, of the one seed. They're in the four. Uh, they're almost as close to the six seed now as they are the one. Uh, what did you make of all the action last night? Yeah, there were some red flags for the Nuggets. <laughs> Obviously, uh, having bet the Nuggets, <laughs> I was especially disappointed. Um, but, uh, you know, if you get an average first half out of Jokic there in the absence of Murray and KCP, you know, the Kings came out the walking dead like they were ready to walk it into the yeah. all-star break it did not feel like the kings were ready to put up a competitive effort at all and any type of uh you know kind of what we've seen from Jokic, where he's been sort of the engine and it's like well this is a big spot i'll, I'll just turn it on today uh, you didn't have it today and i don't know if that was by choice or if it was just uh you know as you said he's out of gas uh uh could be the the latter i do think there's definitely something to be said about uh, how much basketball he played last season and how active his off season was is right into you know basically playing every game so far this season so it's you know there, there's definitely some fatigue to watch for in the month of march um and i am kind of com expecting that coming out of the all-star break where again he's going to have a lot of role you know a lot of responsibilities he's going to have to travel to and from indy uh and then right back to work on the uh on the back side with some tough games like this there's definitely a very clear likelihood i think that the nuggets are gonna f you know fall squarely into that four out of yep. these top four and does that change their change championship equity a little bit? Um, you know, they, if, as long as they have home court in the first round, uh, and again, like we don't exactly know who they're going to draw in the five. It could be the Suns, it could be the Pelicans. Uh, right now, it could be the Mavericks. Yeah. Um, and they have you know kind of meaningful advantage over all those teams. So I'm not like there's no warning bells going off here. Um, but if you have you know if you're the road playoff team in both the second and in Western Conference Finals potentially. That's not great. <laughs> and I think the home court advantage that's manifest by Denver, you want that on your side. And, uh, you know, I think they're they're uh, they're at risk here of, uh, you know, kind of making a repeat a little bit harder than it ought to be. And I think Jokic is definitely at risk of letting this uh, MVP slide out of his fingers. Um, kind of surprised he's still minus 165, minus anything, really. Uh, we talked about it already this week, but uh, I'm kind of uh, itching for a no price there. Yeah, no, definitely. We When we did speak about it a couple of days ago, uh, I said that I thought, irrespective of Jokic being, I think in some spots he was like minus 200 off of the straw pole and Shea was in the plus 300 range. I said then that, you know, I would I would just take Shea head-to-head -head odds agnostic over Jokic, uh, still feel that way, still make Shea the favorite in this market. I just don't think that if this status quo endures, like Jokic's EPM is about to fall behind Donovan Mitchell. Like he's fifth right now in the main all-in-one stat. Yeah, he just takes these random nights off, and that's typically you know you get to do that in an MVP campaign, especially when you were the one seed last year and now you're the four. Like they're plus three sixty to win their division, uh, and they play yeah. in the same division as the <laughs> other guy who's um, who is is the second favorite to win MVP. So. I just I don't understand Jokic's price at all. I'm convinced that it is wrong. Straw poll be damned. Um, I had some people ask me about like how can you feel so confident in Shea when we've just had this straw poll and he got absolutely destroyed. Uh, like how can it change that much? And my thought there is just that I think sometimes and it's a little weird and subjective, but I think sometimes you just need kind of a case to breathe a little bit. Where like Joel Embiid just got hurt. That happened two weeks ago. He was 
going to win MVP if he was healthy. And so we've had two weeks of this weird vacuum uh, of you know the Bucks kind of imploding, but then Giannis destroys Jokic. Uh, Jokic has had, had a good stretch, and then he has this game, and Shea is just kind of coasting along, but he got destroyed by Luka. Like, we just haven't had enough time for people to, I think, just kind of sit back and evaluate all the cases. And without getting in people's heads, I don't think people have figured out how they feel about this race yet. And I think if the status quo endures, I just don't think we're going to get to the point where everyone's like, oh, yeah, it's definitely Jokic, even though his stats are way worse than previous years and he's a four seed. Like, I just don't think that's going to happen. I think that Shea is going to become the guy and also think that there is scope for Luca or Giannis to also make a run at it. Um, and to your point about the Nuggets, I mean, yeah, they've got right now on the season and we are at this point, we're 55 games in, they've got a plus 3.3 net rating. Like that is, it's a red flag. Like it's not great. And maybe they can flip the switch. And if ever there were a team or a player to flip the switch, it's probably the Nuggets and Jokic. But I mean, a lot of people had doubts about the Nuggets going into last playoffs. They were dogs with home court against the Phoenix Suns in that series. And I was very bullish on the Nuggets, but I also feel like my kind of idea about the Nuggets never really got tested because sure. they didn't play anyone. Yeah. The, only real, the only real team they played, I think, was Phoenix. And Phoenix didn't have any depth and their third best player uh, got hurt early on in the series. And it was just Kevin Durant and Devin Booker and they, the team had never really played together. So I don't know. I think that there are probably some flaws with Denver that, that could be exploited. But, um, but what do you think? Yeah, very, very easy to forget how um, soft their path was. <laughs> it was mega soft. Uh, and they had, you know, specific, meaningful matchup advantages against everyone they played. Um, and I think if there is a little bit of residual um, kind of market respect for the fact that they're the defending champs, then we're going to probably be able to take advantage of that at some point. Uh, I think you're going to need the right team to do it, though. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think there are definitely signs that the Nuggets are probably uh, a little bit more vulnerable than people realize. And, um, I mean, I've already made my bet. I'm on the Clippers. <laughs> like, I'm kind of already against them. Uh, and the Clippers are covering themselves in glory right now, albeit, uh, you know, very, very, uh, impressive comeback in the fourth quarter led by, uh, <clears throat> future six man of the year, Norm Powell, um, you know, really, uh, was, was very cool to see. And, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that Ty Lue was as spirited as he was in that game, like, I like that. Like, I like that this team is, you know, is, is very clearly pointed at, like, we are winning. We are. We need to win these games. We cannot uh, take our foot off the gas. This is our shot. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, the Nuggets having a little bit of uh, an exhale after, you know, getting their title last year is is not out of the cars at all. Yep. On Norm uh, and the sixth man of the year market, which is, I think, a bit of a mess right now where I agree that Malik Monk should be the favorite. I think his market price is fair. But I think Tim Hardaway Jr. is just trending towards drawing dead in this yeah. market. Like he's just not getting the minutes. He's not getting the usage. All season when Luca and Kyrie have been fit and playing, Hardaway's at like 15 points per game or something off the bench. He doesn't bring any playmaking. He doesn't bring any defense. The team is, it's not going to be a top four seed. Like he is just trending heavily in the wrong direction. And the only way that I think he can juice his stats up is if uh, Luca or Kyrie get hurt. And then if they get hurt, then he's probably going to start more games, which hurts, and they're probably going to lose more games, which hurts. Like I just don't really see his path at the moment. So I think, actually, I think that the two guys who are arguably more likely to win than Hardaway um, and are the challenges to Monk are Karis LeVert and Norm Powell, and they both have deficiencies. But the thing I like about both of them as the threats to Monk is that Monk's weakness is that he's on an eight seed right now. And they have yeah. a really tough schedule, the Kings remaining. They're not that good as well. Yeah. So I think there's a good chance that they end up as the eight seed. And this award typically doesn't go to eight seeds. Now, with the status quo, I think you'd probably win anyway because the rest of the field is so uninspiring. But it doesn't take much for Levert or Powell to just get a bit more inspiring. Now, Levert's tricky because ideally he would be the guy because he's got the better counting stats than Powell. Uh, he's on this surging team that is likely to be a two seed. Uh, he advanced stats wise. He laps Monk because he's quietly right. become a really good defender and his on off is better and his EPM is better and all of that. It's just he feels so inessential to the Caps. Like he's not closing oh, games. Okoro yeah. is really screwing him uh, yeah. in terms of his case. 
Uh, and I think that something just needs to change with their rotation. Like he needs to get back to playing 26, 27 minutes per game instead of 22, 23. Also just starts to need, mate. He starts to, he has to make some shots as well because he just can't shoot at the moment, which is yeah. a problem. So yeah. Levert, at, uh, he's in the 16 to 1, 20 to 1 most places. I still think there's a bit of meat on the bone there because, you know, if he's 14 and a half and four and a half and excellent defense and better advanced numbers than Monk on a two seed versus an eight seed, and I think there is a path. It's just that he's trending in the wrong direction with Garland back yeah. in his usage. Yeah. But with Powell, Powell, I think, might have a cleaner path because if he just averages 15 points per game the rest of the way. That gets him to 14 on the season. He's at 64% true shooting. If he does that on a top two seed and Monk is an eight, like what do you, what do you think happens in that scenario? It goes to Powell. <clears throat> I think Monk is in trouble, more, much more than you do. <laughs> I, good. I, 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 I look... <clears throat> I don't have a dime on Monk. I don't have a dime on Hardaway. And so I'm talking my book. Uh, but uh, it's uh, there's a there's a mental calculus the voters go through. And if you're in the play in and you might not even be a playoff team. And if you're the eight seed, that's very, very like live. All right. Uh, voters just they're not interested in giving individual guys awards if they're not even on a playoff team, especially because it becomes so much more easy to get into the playoffs. And so, you know, I think ultimately, if you're not a top, if you're not cleanly in, I think you are in deep trouble for basically everything, all NBA, uh, you know, uh, you know, any type of the board here. And so Monk uh, kind of being right on the bubble there, I think hurts this case a lot. I think they need to get cleanly into the six and I don't see that happening very obviously. So um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm low on the Kings generally. I know this, like I, I I'm low on low. I'm way lower on Sabonis than the, than the universe. Apparently he got a fifth place vote for MVP. Why? Oh, I love that. That guy? <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Uh, but, uh, you know, there, there's definitely, um, I think there's definitely a, a, a hard, you know, a misprice on Powell specifically. And if you look at what happened last night in particular, uh, let's give Kawhi the night off. We're coming down the stretch, man. March, they're gonna get they're gonna rotate off days for Kawhi, for PG, and random times. And that usage is gonna get soaked up by Pal. And if he can step up and have kind of clutch performances like he did last night and kind of be the headline that comes out of some of these games, like yes, they're happening at midnight on the East Coast and nobody's watching. But if we're talking about it, if that's like the headline, if, that, if that's the headline, like literally NBA.com, ESPN, like the first, like the first thing on every story, like, oh yeah, what happened in the Clippers game last night against the Warriors? The Warriors were kicking that. Whoa, the Clippers won? How? Headline, pow, <laughs> fourth quarter, hero. Like that was kind of the exact sort of recipe that I think you could get four or five more times between now and the end of the season. And if, if people are kind of in the back of their head, like, man, like, the Clippers are setting themselves up for playoff success by giving Kawhi and PG extra rest, and it's because Norm Powell could absorb those minutes. What a what a sixth man case, and he's started what zero games this season. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's there's a really uh, I think of the of the futures of the awards prices, that's the one that I think is kind of the the uh, the easy obvious low hanging fruit. Yep. No, I like that. I agree with all those points. It's an interesting one with Monk because you know me, a couple of the guys that you know, I speak to about this are. You know, believe that he is like he should be kind of pick against the field, and then there are other people whose opinions I respect, like yourself, who's like, no, his price is completely crazy. Like it is an interesting just disparity of opinion. I'm not sure how it's going to break down, but a couple things on Powell. One, the Clippers randomly still have seven back to backs, which seems like a lot um, now that yeah. we're at the All Star break, and that yeah. I think helps Powell a ton because yes. as we get closer to the playoffs, I think that they are going to sit you know, one of their big three um, and be more conservative, even though they are in the race for the one, I think they'll prioritize health over, you know, going all out to get a one seed they're probably not going to get. And that will help because then you have nights like last night where Norm Powell has, you know, 31 minutes and uh, scores 21 points. I also think he is more essential to the Clippers than Levert is to the Cavs in that, you know, he does close a bit. He unlocks their small ball lineups. He's kind of the only guy who gets the rim uh, on the team who gets the rim and can shoot. Uh, I think that he just has, in an offensive award, he is just a kind of cleaner offensive player than Levert yeah. in terms of a threat to Monk. His issue right now is that like 13.4 points per game is just uncouth. Like it's just not, like he needs to lift that up a little bit. And I think yeah. that he can. Um, and I project he probably will. And then, yeah, I do think he he becomes the threat. 
uh, to Malik Monk. So yeah. I agree. I think the pal is the bet. One kind of final weird kind of commentary on six man of the year. My suspicion is the reason it usually goes to an upper tier team six man is because I think it's difficult for some of the voting block, um, maybe the older voting block, to figure out who the six men are. Right. Yeah. Like there's no like like uh, easy to click through stat. We'll, you know, we'll show, show me those points per game for all of the six men. Right. Like that's not an easy thing to figure out. And so if you're not like regularly watching a lot of basketball, it's not obvious who those guys are. And so I think like there is a segment of the voting block who probably just clicks through the top teams. Like who's the be- who's the six man for the uh, the uh, Celtics? Eh. Who's the six man for the uh, uh, for the Thunder? Yeah. Who's the sixth man for the Wolves? Yeah, right? Like, I think that's like some of how the process goes for making this decision. And you're going to get to the Clippers, and there's already an anchoring for Powell being a good sixth man from years past. And I think if there is also a legacy of, man, I remember in February, March, and April, like he had some big games for them. And this was a good team. And, you know, the Clippers deserve some recognition for surprising us to this degree and also i like i like i just like his chemistry with the rest of the guys on that team like the fact that he can create by himself on ball and the fact that he is uh you know he can be kind of set up uh you know by uh pg and harden in particular like give Kawhi some give Kawhi a blow (laughs) here down the stretch don't need to play him back to backs don't need to risk a re-injury to those knees uh let's get powell uh powell some uh some shine in the uh, fourth quarter of these games yeah I think the good thing with Powell too is that he resonates with probably the more old school voter who values, you know, winning as part of this award. Yeah, no and question. I think he'll also resonate with the more new school voter. Like John Schumann not long ago said that like Powell is his sixth man of the year choice right now. And John Schumann's probably the most analytics based voter in the whole voting block, along with Kevin Pelton. And he's doing that because Powell's got a you know 64% true shooting uh, and is extremely efficient. So sure. I think he has the potential to to resonate um with both sides uh so yeah all right norm pal it is uh just yeah. one other quick awards note before we move on most improved player i think almost had uh almost had some big moments last night where uh kobe white almost hits the three at the buzzer to force overtime after having a really good game that i think really would have ignited his case like irrespective of whether he's going to win or not it would be a travesty if Kobe White wins most improved play. He's not that good. Like he is a middling creator who is bad on defense on a 26 and 29 Bulls team. Yeah. Like, he has no case on merit over these other guys like Maxi and Shangun uh, and the guy that you know we spoke about yesterday in uh, Jalen Williams, where yeah. I don't think Maxi, I would be taking the field pretty confidently over Maxi at this point because that one it's a bad game for them to lose last night. They're it three was. and a half point favorites, and they don't yeah. not going to be favorites in a ton of games while Embiid is out. They have a brutal schedule coming out of the break. I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's like Knicks, Cavs, Bucks, Celtics. Yeah. So I think a slide is coming, and Maxi's efficiency is torpedoing, and I think they're going to fall into the play-in. And uh, and yeah, and the more I think about it, the more bullish I grow on the Jalen Williams idea. Stan Van Gundy and Bill Simmons both talked him up, a couple of voters. Oh, I think really? he actually does have the best case on merit where <laughs> talk like his Darko increase, his EPM increase. Yeah. He's the only guy of any of the candidates who's projected to be in the top six in their conference, yeah. like top yeah. six. And he could be a one seed. He's emerged yeah. as the number two option on a team that could be a one seed. It's just, you never know how this award is going to go because it's so subjective. Well, you yeah. have some idea how it's going to go, but I think there is a world where it does coalesce behind Jalen Williams. Um, because of it. the advanced stats and because of the team record. Yeah, I, I mostly just want to be no maxi, but if you're going to be yes someone, you might as well be yes at a huge price for Jalen Williams because yeah. he has improved so much. Yeah. Like, guy is absolutely killing it right now. Uh, yeah. And really since like Christmas, man, I mean, goodness gracious, he is playing good basketball. And um, the maxi no case, by the way, it also, I mean, I test, he's starting to get beat up. Like, yeah, I don't didn't know. That. I watched the fourth quarter of that game against Miami. Yeah. Like, one, the sixes aren't any good. And then, two, <laughs> there were just possessions where Max is drilling around, like, oh, what do I do? Uh, falling away three with two guys in my face. Yeah. He's, he is, he is starting to wear the fatigue of being the guy carrying an offense. Like, there are very outstanding guards that we have seen 
fail to be able to carry offense for a sustained period of time over the history of the last uh you know decade watching nba and uh, honestly if monk can i mean if um excuse me if uh a maxi can do it then he deserves the award but you're starting to see signs that he can't and if he ultimately uh you know either takes an injury or just his numbers start to just go in the ac- you know, absolute tank you should not be surprised yeah no i i'm 100 there i think as well last thing on this one like Kobe White can definitely win. Like he's got the biggest raw stat increase. He plays in Chicago, gets attention. But I think his five to one, six to one price, I think that's about about fair. Uh, but I think that the guy who is taking up too much book aside from Maxi is, I just don't think Shengun's going to win because that yeah. team has really fallen off. I don't think it's fair. Like he would be on my ballot, yeah. certainly. But I yeah. just don't think he has the pull and the juice yeah. that these other guys have so the two soldiers i'd be going to war with a kaminga in the 10 to 1 range and then jalen williams uh, in the 50 to 1 type of range i think is still out there um last thing just a wrapping up thought on on six man um that i want to hit so i'm able to bring up like russell westbrook as an antidote to power or at least like fractures his case when zubach is there when they and they play two bigs a ton like westbrook's minutes they just dwindle when zoo is in and it's a little bit skewed because uh, the, the couple of games recently, I think against Detroit and Minnesota, where Westbrook did play good minutes, but in the Detroit game, like Norm got his face smacked in and he could he left the game. And then in the Minnesota game, the Clippers were doing the thing that they did um, in the playoffs the year after the bubble, where it's like, no, we're going small ball. Uh, yeah. Terrence Mann at the corner. Let's run this back against Rudy Gobert. And uh, it didn't work. No. So I think ultimately I project that Westbrook goes back to that kind of 18 to 20 minutes. And Norm is more in the 26 and establishes himself as 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 the yeah. candidate. He started all 53 games, Jay. I mean, he's excuse me, he's played in all 53 games. He has started zero. Yes. Norm Powell. Yep. That's 82 <laughs> Norm. All right. Uh all-star weekend, which is a uh, strange betting event, a conglomerate of strange betting events. Uh, what are you looking forward to on the weekend? Ooh, uh, well, for betting and watching, it starts for me with the rising stars. And usually this is a total throwaway, right? Because it's literally just guys who are happy to be the part of the fanfare and they, uh, they're doing the, you know, the kind of the all-star basketball, you know, nonsense, which I don't find super entertaining. Uh, but uh, they shook up the format this year. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about this, but they've actually broken it up into four teams and we're doing like a little mini tournament. Um, And uh, it's pretty cool the way that they've broken up the teams to where you're going to get a lot more of like just sort of concentrated rotations instead of like everybody getting their chance on a floor for a longer game that has zero stakes. Right. This is kind of a cooler. I think it was a very, very smart. Uh, reshaping of the format, uh, and if you haven't looked at the rosters and you're wondering, wow, boy, Team Detlef got the uh, sh- the shaft here. He's basically got an all G League team, <laughs> and but it's G League guys who are like going to play hard, hard, hard because they want ten day contracts badly. Like this is a showcase for those guys, um, and that's pretty cool that they've invited them. Uh, for me, Team Powell is like the clear, clear, clear head and shoulders best roster. Uh, you have Wemby, Brandon Miller, Pods from Golden State, Jaime Hakez Jr. from Miami, Jabari Smith from Houston, Kaysen Wallace from OKC, and then Kulaby from uh, from the Wizards. I mean, <clears throat> it's going to be amazing to see Wemby play with like really other young, talented players. Um, and there is in the back of my head a little concern because it took the Spurs so long to figure out how to play with a guy like Wemby and maybe... It's just not the format for kind of other talented players to figure out how to play well with Wemby. But um, ultimately, I think uh, the uh, the Spurs are, I mean, excuse me, the, uh, the team pow is, is probably ought to be odds on here, just looking at from a talent standpoint. So, uh, and I'm, I'm very just excited to sit down and watch how other players play it you know, interact with and play against, uh, you know, a team with Wemby and Brandon Miller and, and Jaime Jaquez. Like, this is this is a very cool uh, roster for Team Pal. So, uh, okay. Team Pal plus money for me. All right. Chips in Team Pal. Uh, these other events, I've been screwed a lot over the journey in the three-point contest, albeit mainly in the WNBA three-point contest, which has cost me a lot of money uh, over the years. But uh, do you have any read on the three-point or the dunk contest? Ooh, three-point contest is probably Halliburton's to lose in my opinion because he is so familiar with the setting and he did have last year to kind of get his feet under him with the format um five to one is is a reasonable play he was in the top three last year dame took him down 
Uh, Dame's not shooting it especially well right now, although that kind of throw that out the window for the way that the three three point contest format is is set up. Um, but yeah, with the kind of familiarity of the setting uh, and uh, having already had one contest where he performed well, I'm fine going to war with Halliburton there at five to one. But your points are fair. Like this is super small stakes stuff. Like I, I just do this to have some you know kind of entertainment factor beyond what is otherwise uh, an exhibition. Yep. Uh, dumb contest. Uh, I'm stunned that Jaime Harkes uh, is in this. I didn't realize that uh, he could jump. Uh, I saw him in person <laughs> a couple of weeks ago in the garden. Uh, and if you told me that he's a dumb contest participant, I would have thought it was a, a, a typo. Um, is Mac McClung just going to win this again? He's minus 225. He better have some new stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I, I really don't have a, a solid read here. The fact that Jalen Brown is a name. Uh, and that people yeah. may want, you know, kind of there may be a little bit of bias to give him uh, an extra boost with uh, some ratings is, is maybe worth paying attention to. Um, you don't have defenders that are going to make Jalen Brown go left uh, and in the dunk <laughs> contest. So, yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> so you may get to show off some some of the athleticism that we have known to uh, come and enjoy about his game. But um, yeah, no, I I. I uh, I probably am going to turn it off before we get to the dunk contest, if we're being honest. It's just been a really long time since we had a super entertaining one. And if Jaime Hakez does some cool stuff, I'll watch it on, you know, I'll watch the replays. But um, yeah, what a, what, a, what a strange field. Yeah, I mean, this is Jalen Brown, uh, fifth best player on his own team. This is his chance <laughs> to be number one uh, for an evening. Uh, All-star game MVP. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Giannis, LeBron, the favorites, the reigning champ. Jason Tatum is the third favorite at plus 900. Mm. We have Steph Dame, KD. Now, I typically don't bet this um, pre-flop. I, I, a lot of books trade this market live, which is an interesting decision uh, and very difficult to trade the All-Star Game MVP market live. So that will probably be where my bets come in uh, if they do. But uh, do you have any feeling on this one? Leaning uh, in the direction of Halliburton again, just because of the home yeah. crowd. I know this is like it's not that's not a strong angle, but at this price, I think it's fair. Um, could he have twenty assists in this game? Sure. Could he have twenty assists or three quarters? Sure. Like there's entirely a scope where he is sort of the uh, the creator offensively for uh, for his squad, and then that's enough to kind of get him the home crowd vote. Um, you know, I think. You know, usually this comes down to trying to parse minutes. Uh, and in general, if there's a coach who you think is likely to give a guy extra minutes because he really cares about the award, well, that's probably out the window between, uh, you know, for for Tatum this year because he's already got one. I mean, I don't think he's necessarily chasing glory where he's trying to rack up as many all-star MVPs as possible, but who knows. Um, so I would expect that it's probably, you know, it's probably going to, you know, I would look to that team and, and point towards someone else who's, uh, who could soak up some of those minutes and Halliburton would be sort of the easy, obvious answer there. Okay. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that is interesting. I will say that like someone who is extremely pro Jason Tatum, big Celtics man have been over the journey, have been this season as well. I lost a lot of respect for Tatum, the way that he kind of was gunning in that all-star game last year. Like it wasn't a great spectacle. It'd be like just people watching him just kind of take step back threes over and over again. But uh, I guess he had his moment and there was the one cool uh, possession with Jalen Brown. But uh, I don't think I'm going to be watching a ton of this game. All right. Uh, before we get to some real competition in WTA Doha, the countdown to spring training is on. So for those looking to get a head start on the upcoming MLB season, grab your Roto World Baseball Draft Guide. It's loaded with comprehensive positional rankings, projections, and player profiles to ensure your draft is a success. Visit NBCSports.com slash draft guide and use code BASEBALL24 to get 10% off at checkout. All right, WTA Doha, a uh, couple of big quarterfinals. Shviantek oh, is a minus 1,000 favorite over Vika uh, as a ranker at plus 550. Uh, and then the resurgent, Naomi Osaka, who looks stunningly good, uh, is minus 135 against uh, Karolina Pliskova. Uh, what's your read on these two? Yeah, so uh, Iga, Iga comfortably, uh, and I think uh, the the Pliskova Osaka um, match is a fascinating one because we saw these two go head to head in Brisbane uh, earlier this year, which was sort of the second match on Naomi's comeback tour, and uh, she looked great 
albeit losing uh, to Pliskova. Uh, and I think some of the takeaway was, man, I guess Osaka just is, she's not ready yet. She doesn't have it yet. Um, but I would say that uh, what we have learned for, about Pliskova since then is that uh, she's in form. <laughs> Her serve is mighty, mighty solid right now. She is, of course, coming off of a 250 championship in Transylvania. Um, and uh, so she's going to be a tough out here. But uh, I think it's going to, if you, you know, if you haven't, if, if the you know you're, the results going to be in the books by the time you listen to this podcast, I think it's probably worth going back and watching this anyway because uh, the Osaka comeback is pretty important if you're handicapping women's tennis for the balance balance of the season. Uh, her price for U.S. Open futures, by the way, has been slashed aggressively. Um, yeah. It's you know, if you don't know about Osaka, she is one of the she has had one of the highest ceilings of hardcore players we have seen on the women's tour since Serena Williams, which means that she is. She's not going to be a factor on clay. She's not going to be a factor on grass. You know, you can probably forget about looking at those prices. It's just going to be tune up for her for the hard court swing through the U.S. Um, but she could be a factor in Indian Wells. She could be a factor in Miami. She's very comfortable on those two surfaces, and uh, particularly at Miami, I think is is uh, going to be somebody you you know is a must watch because that's going to be the route the, about the time of her comeback where she will have had enough uh, you know kind of match testing to you know kind of know. You know what is her level, um, and so it's it's important to kind of gauge that because uh, if there is a you know if there's a fifth player outside of the big four right now who could be a factor come U.S. Open, it is 100 uh, percent Naomi Osaka, and so uh, it's exciting for the world of tennis, and and it's exciting to kind of understand really where the rest of the tour- tournament field. Um, you know, at the WTA field kind of exists right now. Like, uh, Iga is playing unbelievably well in Doha. They go right from Doha to Abu Dhabi. Uh, these are, um, excuse me, Dubai. Right from Doha to Dubai, Abu Dhabi just ended. Uh, Abu Dhabi, by the way, <clears throat> Elena Rabakina was um, magnificent. Uh, I still am, like, really, really scratching my head as to how she lost that Australian Open tiebreaker and what was what the longest tiebreaker in the history of tennis. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't want to relive that one, but uh, yeah, I mean, Rabakina is on form right now. I think Doha is probably coming down to Iga v Rabakina, uh, and uh, that's going to be an extremely telling match for kind of understanding how to price both Dubai uh, and then the U.S. Uh, double Sunshine double, uh, which is uh, of course Indian Wells and Miami back to back. Um, cool that they kind of gave all of these high profile women's tournaments this early in the season to kind of get us an opportunity to see all these women go head to head. Um, also, you know, the other two news and notes in the WTA right now, if you're handicapping that field, um, still haven't seen Sabalenka since she won the Australian Open. She has taken a nice long break. Uh, and uh, I don't know about that. I, you know, I'm surprised that she's passing up on the opportunity to get points because she should be, she should have some respect for how talented the overall field is right now and she's completely giving up her opportunity to be world number one at the end of the year which is probably not great for her for rankings purposes because you don't want a difficult path in these majors if you're going to try to chase some more um and so i think uh, ultimately sabalenka has been a no-show um coco goff has been way way underwhelming uh, and I don't really know what's going on with her. Uh, she's still sort of in exhale mode from the U.S. Open Championship. It looks like. Uh, and then, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 weird. Uh, and uh, and then you know the the player form of note that is kind of drawing the most attention is Ons Jabor. Um, something's going on there. Uh, and if you had high hopes that she was going to make a run at Wimbledon this year, uh, you are desperately watching some of these matches looking for any sign of life because it has not been a, a glorious start to 2024. That's sad. Oh, it poor Hans. It's just not yeah. going to happen. For, she was uh, so close. It's twice. So close. Yeah. The, the second one in particular to get, get completely <laughs> dusted by Von Drusfer is, uh, is shameful. Um, I've had, I had a couple of people message me after um, our award show asking if, um, if comeback player was my worst loss, like not even close, like on <laughs> like, yeah, blowing oh, Wimbledon from minus a thousand in running when she took the first set off of Lander yeah. back at her. Like you can get like comeback player. Like it's hard to get a ton of money. Like it takes a lot of work. You can get a lot down on a, on a Wimbledon outright. Uh, yeah. And <laughs> the price was wrong at kind of every moment of the tournament. Yeah. And uh, Dude. I had a friend, I had a friend who was uh, similarly on Ons who after she blew that final, he had to go to hospital. 
<laughs> yeah, so he just looks like, no, I need to be, I, I, I need, 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 need medical attention. It's unbelievable. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just she feels was, like she's blown it, really. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to relive it entirely, but that was the <laughs> that was the most beautiful handicap that I've ever had in tennis, and it was well, very close. Um, it was like 50 to 1 on 6 to 1 fair in a yeah. tennis outright. It's unbelievable. yeah, yeah. Yeah, you had no you had no Russians or Belarusians in that tournament because yep. of the ban. You had a number of other kind of high profile players who were either hurt or just out of the mix. Yep. And uh, and yeah, she was in playing the best tennis of her life. Wins Madrid, almost wins Rome. Like you know, didn't didn't gas herself in Roland Garros, so she was fresh for the grass. Oh my gosh! And uh, yeah, the, as you mentioned, the price was just so wrong for so long. <laughs> that was that was Max Hain. Everyone got yeah. knocked out as well. Like all of the threats got knocked out. She had this incredibly easy draw where she's yeah. playing. Who's her friend? Like the older uh, Tatiana she had, yeah, Maria. Like, that's it, Tatiana Maria. She's like Bushkova. <laughs> Elise Merton was like yes. her big, my girl. Elise Merton's yes. uh, <laughs> always fond of and. Uh, Always kind of like, why is Elise Merton's three hundred to one to win this? Time? Oh, that's why she's three hundred. <laughs> oh, because she can't win a semifinal. I yeah, gotcha. exactly. But uh, no, that that was a tough one, especially because she won the first set, was looking so good in the final. But uh, oh, well, I feel bad for Ons, uh, and uh, we'll be cheering for her uh, forever, no matter what, uh, no matter how much she's cost me over the journey. All right, uh, NHL futures. We don't talk a lot of puck, but I wanted to bring this up after our um, visit together to our T-Mobile Arena in Las mm -hmm. Vegas for mm -hmm. an excellent uh, game between the Oilers and the Knights where the magnificent Aiden Hill, who's doing like karate uh, lion jumping saves in net for the Knights, uh, broke the Oilers' streak uh, where they were one win shy of tying the all-time record. Uh, so why I wanted to talk hockey is... I think there is a bet to be made in the Stanley Cup market. I also think it's a kind of interesting macro discussion where the Oilers right now, notwithstanding Aiden Hill's uh, karate exploits, the Oilers are an absolute juggernaut. Uh, yeah. They closed in that game against the Knights in Vegas. The Knights won the Stanley Cup last year. The Oilers closed like minus 150 in that game. And I understand that Jack Eichel is out and Shea Theodore is out and the Knights are banged up, but they're still going up against Aiden Hill, who's one of the best goalies in the league. And the, team did win the Stanley Cup last year. There was a minus 150 in that game. They were like minus 160 against the Leafs um, a few weeks ago. Like this team was by market, like in the in the playoffs last year, they were going off favorite in Vegas against a fully formed Vegas team that won and lifted the cup in the yeah. end. So the market believes this team is a juggernaut. And I know that some people are like, oh, well, the way that the team plays and it's too offensive of stars, so I'm going to carry over the playoffs. Well, I just think with that kind of stuff, like whatever my opinion at least is of a hockey team, like the market, the game to game liquid hockey market knows more than I do about who is good in the playoffs. And the market thinks that the Oilers were a juggernaut last year. I think they're probably better this year. And right now they're plus 850 to lift the cup. Like they have uh, some spots that are plus 850. They have the same odds as the Avs. They're just better than the Avs. The Avs have like four players. Like they have no depth whatsoever. And I think that macro wise this is a good reminder that often where books get outrights wrong and everyone wants to hunt for long shots uh on outrights uh oh and can the lakers make a run to the finals and stuff like often where it is mispriced is on the favorite uh and on the team that is most likely to win because when you're betting an outright the calculus you need to make is is betting this price better than rolling over likely series prices and with the Oilers, like they are going to be favorite in every series that they play. They might be favorite in every game that they play. Uh, and I just think that we are not going to get to the end of the regular season and they're still going to be plus 850 to lift the cup when they're going to be so heavily favored uh, and they have the team that they do. So uh, what do you think of that? And what do you think about the idea of, um, in the more macro sense, how favorites are often priced in these markets? Yeah, so on my way out of town, <clears throat> after cashing some season-long futures, uh, reinvested some on the Clippers, um, on a uh, on a Kentucky Derby future on the horse named Speakeasy, <laughs> and, and on the Oilers. Uh, and the Oilers bet was probably the similarly kind of shaped by what we saw in that market and in that game, where it was like, 
I don't know, man, that second period of that game should have been three, nothing Oilers. They were dominant and, uh, you know, they didn't catch the breaks. The pressure of the streak was maybe some, you know, some, some impact on it, but, uh, we ride Oilers, no question Stanley cup price. And I think your general philosophy and breakdown makes sense to me from a market standpoint. I will say that like, I generally don't get involved much on hockey playoff stuff because it feels like every year in May, you're like them, them, (laughs) how, huh? Like there's some of that that happens every year just because goalie stands on his head and, you know, like, and maybe the game is called a little bit differently. They allow a little more physicality Uh, and the Oilers. It's worth noting, like one of their most dynamic aspects is they're just unbelievable power play. And so if that's slightly less called in the playoffs, maybe that uh, takes a little bit of juice out of them. But um, I think you're right where they're going to be favored heavily in every series. And I think they're going to be, they could be favored in every game. It's very likely. Uh, And uh, you know, there are some people out there who have some absolutely obscene prices because they started the season so slow and uh, we ride with them. We are all Oilers. Uh, the only thing that kind of spooks me, they're Canadian. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but no, we are we are men of oil. Um, like Daniel Day-Lewis and there will be blood. Uh, I think the thing that people get a little bit caught up in is the idea of that, you know, the NHL playoffs are just like completely random and it just takes one hot goalie and then the team wins. Or like people look at the Panthers last year. And I'm like, I was on... Uh, I was on the Panthers in a big way to win the East and to win the Cup. I went down to Florida to watch them in Game 3 at the Stanley Cup Finals, which is one of the best uh, games I've ever been to uh, Mm -hmm. across all sports. Like, a lot of stuff had to go right for the Panthers. Like, my ticket on the Panthers at 30-1 to to win the East, like, they were down 3-1 in the first round to Boston. uh, And I think Brad Marchand has a breakaway with three seconds left, and he's one-on-one with Bobrovsky. If he just slots out, the season's over. They have to win overtime there. They have to win a ridiculous game six. Game seven, they have to go empty net down a goal with 59 seconds left. They have to tie it up there, and then they have to win an OT. Let's get out of the first round in a series where like a lot had to go right for the Panthers, uh, and it's not like it just randomly every year a team gets hot from the eight seed and makes the cup finals. Like Some teams are better than other teams, and they are favored in individual games and series for a reason. So I think with the Oilers, like it kind of reminds me of – um, you know, we spoke about it before the season, how, you know, the Celtics were like plus 500, plus 550 to win the title. And like nothing has really happened. And now they're plus 260. And I understand the Bucks have been worse than expected and Embiid got hurt. But even before Embiid got hurt, the Celtics were like plus 300. Uh, so sometimes the market just, it, I don't think it adjusts enough to just, it doesn't project enough that, oh, as time elapses and the status quo just endures and the days tick along, this team is going to get shorter and shorter, even though nothing is happening. Like they're just performing as expected and avoiding injuries. And of course, like McDavid get hurt or whatever, but that's, you know, we're dealing in, you know, low likelihoods here. So uh, I think the Oilers are the bet. And it's why I do think the Dallas Stars as well at a plus 550 to win the West. I think they are kind of a sleeping, well, they're not sleeping anymore. They're just kind of a, an excellent team uh who are really starting to roll now they had this absence of their best defenseman Miro Heiskinen uh he is back Mm. uh as Kid Wyatt Johnson has emerged like I think that they are the second best team in the west and they're being priced as though they're the fourth best so Mm. I think the Oilers and the Stars are the teams to ride with uh in the puck okay well for me I'm gonna I'm gonna stick Edmonton only Okay. Canada, it's coming Canada home. Early. It's All coming right. home. Uh, yeah, we uh, we'll uh, uh, we'll we'll revisit this as we get closer to the playoffs. But uh, I saw enough. Yeah, I had I would fully endorse a uh, Edmonton Oilers times Shea Gilgis Alexander MVP full Ooh. Canadian parlay. Um, <laughs> and if you want to throw in Norm Powell six man of the year and Jalen Williams uh, most improved player and get to uh, 50,000 to one or whatever that is uh, fully endorsed as well All right, <laughs> don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages thanks to those watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel if you're listening to us in podcast form don't forget to rate and subscribe also a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music, just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports from Jay Croucher and Drew Dinsick. Good luck this weekend, and we'll see you next week.